Welcome to How to Write Good. I'm your host, Daniel Poppy. You can find out more about me at danielpoppy.com. Um, you can check out my... Oh, yeah, I forgot how to... forgot that I... Poppy, that's the last name. It's spelled P-O-P-P-I-E. You can figure out Daniel for yourself. It's a secret to everyone. Uh, besides that, you can check out my book, The Ninth Hour, at, at, on my website. It is a... Just check it out. There's a little video going over everything. Don't need to explain everything. Or you can check out my serialized. You can check out my serialized novel. Chapter 10 is coming out in September. I'm. It's amazing how it's already September. Uh, it seems like the beginning of the year just started, which is kind of crazy, which is a bit scary, which I have been getting stuff done. It just doesn't feel like it. Besides that, oh yeah, if you want uh, How to Write Good merch, you can also check that out. Swag. I hate the word swag. I think it's the dumbest thing ever, but let's use it. Um, it's not the dumbest thing, but it's pretty close. Besides that, we are going to get into uh, the word of the week. The word of the re- week is maladroit. And uh, if you if you know some words, if you if you know words, right, you probably know there's a word that is co- that is adroit. And adroit means skillful. And if you know a, if you know Latin, or if you know a modicum of Latin, modicum, modicum, I'm not sure. If you know a tiny bit of Latin, right? Then you know that mal means bad in Latin or evil, something like that. Malice, maleficent, you know, uh, malevolent uh, it has that mal word in it. So if you have adroit, which means skillful, and you put mal in front of it. It's going to mean the opposite, ineffective, bungling, clumsy. Makes sense? So that is our word of the week. I hope that you enjoy it. That's actually something you would be able to use in your regular speech. Um, the, the thing I don't like about that word is that it's an adjective, and I want it to be a noun. Uh, there's just something about it that makes me want it to be a noun. Like, I want to call you a maladroit, right? <laughs> ineffective, bungling, clumsy. You could be like, oh, you are... You are maladroit because you can use the adjective in that in that way, or you could say they're a maladroit person. But I just know I I, I guess maybe it sounds like droid, you know, uh, and droid is a noun. So I want maladroit to be a noun because maybe it just sounds similar. And I'd love just to call someone that. But why not? Why not just use it that way? All right, um, man. I feel like there's something else that I was gonna say, but we're gonna just jump into our our accidental lessons because. That's what we do. Our accident lessons is about straw men. And uh, we are not, man, if I could connect it somehow to Wizard of Oz, that'd be fantastic. But we are not, actually I can't, we are not going to be talking about the, um, we're not going to be talking about the Scarecrow and the Wizard of Oz. We are actually going to be talking about the logical fallacy, the straw man fallacy. So if you don't know, um, there's a scarecrow in the Wizard of Oz, and he doesn't have a brain, and he sings a song about wanting to have a brain. Did you also know, if you don't already know that, the Wizard of Oz is a book, and it's a lot more fun. Eh, It's more fun, I think, than the movie, but the guy who wrote the book wrote about 70,000, literally, you know, 70,000 books that are around that world. Some are better than others. Some are bizarre. Some, I think, are just as fun as the Wizard of Oz, but give it a read. The guy was on acid probably when he um, wrote them, something like that. Maybe maybe they were doing some LSD back then. You know, I'm not sure when LSD was invented. So uh, we're not talking about the Scarecrow from the Wizard of Oz, um, though someone who does use a straw man may not have a brain. We are not going to be talking about the Scarecrow. The Scarecrow does get a brain. Well, he doesn't get a brain. He gets a degree. I think in the movie, I can't remember if he gets a, a brain in the. Um, I don't think he gets a, a brain in the in the book either. He just gets a degree. The funny thing about that is, I'm pretty sure that the guy who wrote the book, he was writing in like the turn of the century, around that. I think. Uh, I think it was in the 1800s. Uh, at, it was in the early 1900s at the very latest, and he. I'm pretty sure that joke about um, people having a degree and not having a brain is in the book, so it's timeless, right? Uh, but I might be wrong about that, so definitely feel free to correct me because I don't care to die on that hill. So no more straw man. 
um, that is the theme of this week's accidental lessons. That's the theme of this week's podcast. And I think it's something that will be beneficial to you. I think it's, I think it's beneficial in your right. Most of the time when I run into something that is good for writing, it's also good for life in general. I find, um, if you, uh, certain things are more geared toward writing, but there are certain things that are like, Hey, you know, this is very important. So I, I talk about this idea that if you, if you want to be a good writer, have experiences like actual life experiences because even if you there's certain people who are phenomenal writers and certain people can gain that level of skill some people are naturally phenomenal writers but if you it's it's pairing it's a it's niching down that's what it is right if you um if you've been attacked by a bear and you've survived the bear attack and you can put two if you can barely write you can write a book and get it published because you're like hey uh when you go to your when you write your query letter you know you're going to a publisher you're going to an agent you'll be like hey i was attacked by a bear uh I, this is my memoir of being attacked by a bear and surviving and the after effects and being in the hospital i would like to um this is why i think this would work uh as a published book and they'll be like yeah Somebody's attacked by a bear and they survived. Yeah, we'll definitely, we're definitely going to publish that sucker because who doesn't want to hear about a bear attack, right? So, um, so yeah. So if you if you have experiences, you know, if you have really interesting experiences, you're more likely to um, be able to flip those experiences into a book, right? Or you just have to. Ha- you don't necessarily have to write a memoir, right? You can take your experiences and you can put them into fiction, which a lot of people do. And some people write, um, they like, they write about, they write, not black ops. Is it black ops? I have no idea. So they write about these special force units going into whatever country and doing stuff, uh, covert operations. And um, they can do that because they have that experience. You can also read about it and figure it out. But there's other things that you can add to a book just besides this basic um experience that you've done you can extend your experiences this is not related to what we're talking about today but i think it'll help you uh you can take an experience and you can stretch it it just it takes some imagination but when you stretch the experience you need to make sure it's actually um truthful uh truthful in the subjective manner if that makes sense uh how would i say that it 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 fits with the world it fits with what you're writing it's believable there we go so when you stretch your experiences, make sure your experiences stay believable. In some cases, you're writing something and you put something in there that is totally unbelievable, but it fits with what you're writing. You know, um, it's just bizarre, but it's just like, you know, this is how this writer works. So we're going to go with it. So, um, yeah, so I try to I try to bring up topics or it seems to be the case that if it's good for writing, it's ten, it tends to be good for your life in general. And I think this is one that is good for your life in general. So stick around and we're going to be talking about the straw man fallacy. We're going to be talking about how that relates to writing. And we are going to be talking about um, the biggest offenders of this, right? So first of all, if you have been around this podcast for a while, then you probably know what the straw man fallacy is. But for those of you who don't know, a lot of people do, but if you do not know, don't worry, it's not that big of a deal. Uh, Just because you don't know something doesn't mean that you are unintelligent. Just learn it, uh, figure out what it is. Uh, If you can't understand it, uh, maybe the person who is explaining it isn't doing a good job. I ran into this a lot. Um, There's not a lot of things that I found that I can't understand. There's certainly things that I don't understand, right? There's certainly things that math, I'm not good at math at all. I'm not good at math at all and any higher level math. And uh, there's certain things in uh, math that I look at, I'm like, you know, I, I don't understand it and I don't have the time to understand it. Not that I couldn't, but uh, most other things, what, I, what I've run into in my life is when I don't understand something, it's typically the, the person who is talking, right? So the person talking isn't, they aren't making sense. They're not systematic in how they approach it. They're presenting it to me in a way that is cluttered and um, cluttered and disordered. Or too slow. That happens to me too. So it's a it's not just their fault. Uh, in some cases, they are explaining it clearly, and it's just my personality butting butting up against it. But if you don't understand something, um, look at different sources for trying to understand it, and you might actually understand it just because that person who's telling you stuff, uh, it might not be doing a good job. Not all teachers are good at teaching, unfortunately. 
unfortunately. Um, so yeah, so if you don't know what a straw man fallacy is, what a straw man fallacy is, is you present a, you, you look at your opponent, opponent's argument, you say you present like a bad argument of your opponent's argument, and then you knock down your opponent's argument with, with points. Because uh, what happens is um, people underestimate their opponents, especially if, if people live in a bubble, right? If you never ha are in contact with your opponent's arguments, you're going to be you're, you're not going to care as much to present them in a way that is um, how they present them, right? you are presenting them in a way you you're just presenting them in a way to to um rebut them you're not presenting them in a way to understand them which is what you should be doing you're presenting them in a way to rebut them and you don't get any kickback because if you live in a bubble uh, nobody is telling you oh you know that's not actually what that person thinks okay it's similar to what that person thinks, but it's not actually what that person thinks. And, and that's what the straw is happening in the straw man argument. You're presenting something similar to what somebody thinks, or maybe you're presenting the surface level. Maybe you're presenting um, the basic points of what they say, but that you don't explain it. You're just like, well, this is stupid because of this. This is stupid because of that. When that person uh, presenting the argument would really would end up presenting it in a way that is um, is more complex, right? Uh, I think this happens in politics probably every single day. Now, there are ad hominems. Politics is, is uh, probably, it's the, politics is just, everything bad happens in politics. Um, I have a theory on that. I think the reason why it does is because people are trying to get power and people are trying to sway groups of people who aren't necessarily thinking logical. Uh, people are trying to sway groups of people who are, thinking more emotionally. So if you're thinking more emotionally, uh, you're not going to be swayed as much by logic. You're going to be swayed by other things that are end up being logical fallacies, unfortunately. But um, where was I going with this? But with the straw man fallacy, so there's a lot of straw man fallacies in politics. What happens is uh, one side presents their own argument and they say, oh yeah, and my opponent wants to do this, 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 and this. And it's not really representing their opponent correctly. It's not really representing their argument correctly. Uh, the reason I think that we get so many straw man fallacies popping up in politics is because we live in a soundbite culture, right? And what I mean by soundbite culture is, is you have 15 seconds to say your piece. Uh, this happens on this debate stages uh, for like presidential elections. You have 15 seconds to say your piece. Uh, you are trying to convince people or you're trying to show you're trying to make your opponent look bad and um and then you 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 present it you don't have enough time to actually either you don't have enough time or you don't care to present your opponent in an actually um nuanced light it's a shortcut to thinking uh, most logical fallacies are shortcuts to thinking but this one this one definitely is because you, you already have your idea everybody I don't know anyone who doesn't want their ideas that they think to be true, right? Does that make sense? So every person that I've ever met wants what they think to be the truth. Uh, and if you're, if you, there, there's probably somebody out there's like, no, I don't actually want what I think to be the truth. Um, well, you want that to be the truth, right? There's something, if you hold, if you hold beliefs closely, then or if you you're you you're a big believer in a certain area you probably want your beliefs to be true and uh, the reason why we resort to logical fallacies in general is because it allows us to maintain those beliefs without thinking about them because if you suddenly are like well are these true or not it's uncomfortable and uh, un discomfort is a kind of a type of pain and people don't like dealing with pain anxiety i think is it's similar to pain i don't know if you call it pain but that, that discomfort is anxiety typically but uh the straw man fallacy again just to reiterate just in case you didn't get it before it's where you're setting up an opponent's argument and you are setting it up in a bad way you're setting it up uh the, the idea is that you're building a straw man argument of what they're doing of, of what they think i mean and then because it's such a bad argument because it's not their actual nuanced argument then you can knock it down really easily um now I, a, real, a really quick side note here: If your opponent is presenting an argument that is bad, you are not, and you argue against that bad argument, right? So, if the opponent actually is presenting an argument that isn't nuanced and it and it 
and it's really surface level, if you are knocking that argument down, that's not straw manning your opponent's argument. That's just arguing against a bad argument. There are bad arguments, but a straw man argument comes into place when you are um, a straw man argument comes into place when you are when the person actually has an argument and you are automatically going to presenting it in a, in a way that is stupid and presenting it in a way that is easy, easily rebutted. Um, so the, the issue is that we actually, I think that what we have to do when we come in contact with arguments that we think are bad is we actually have to understand them, right? We can't assume that argument is, that everything we hear is all there is to the argument. We have to make sure we dig into it first, right? We have to dig into the argument and then we have to decide whether this is a good argument. And if it is a really bad argument, be like, hey, this is why? in a way that isn't isn't ridiculing the person. And if it's a good argument, then actually take on the, the good parts of the argument and don't create a straw man. Uh, why why is the straw man fallacy or any fallacy bad? Well, it it's like I said before, it's lazy. But besides being lazy, it misrepresents someone. Um, and typically when you if you are knowingly if you're if you're doing it because you're just short the you're using a shortcut to thinking right it's lazy uh if you're if you're doing it because of that oh i'm too tired i don't have enough time i i give you a little more leeway but if you're doing it to to be disingenuous i assume that your argument or you're not very strong in your own argument so if you present somebody else's argument in a bad way like if you present it really weakly just to get rid like knock it down I assume that you aren't very, um, you don't know your own arguments very well, but it misrepresents another person. It's taking what somebody else says and it's twisting it a little bit and that you're lying. You might knowing be, knowingly be lying. You might not knowingly be lying, but you're lying about what this person actually is saying. Oh. And um, I think what it does too is it keeps you in your own little bubble, right? Um, if you are creating a straw man argument, you're not actually taking on any of the issues with your own argument. It, you don't actually take on the, the issues with your own argument. Uh, and it's not clear thinking, right? You're not actually thinking clearly if you're just presenting the worst argument your opponent has, or if you're presenting an argument that your opponent doesn't even have, you're just placing it on them and it's a bad argument. Uh, clear thinking is actually very important. Clear thinking is really important, and I think that the only way we can, and I've gone back to this, and I've had an, an episode on this on logic. Maybe I'll redo the logic episode on why I think it's so important, because I, I do think it's really important. I think that we should be basing how we're thinking and how we're doing pretty much everything on it, and uh, the reason why I think that we should base it on that is because um, it is an underlying structure to thought. It is an underlying structure to the world, and if um, it's not something that you can, you can't argue log for logic with logic very well because it's trying to support itself. It's like circular, which is also a logical fallacy. But it's it seems to be where you're just trying to present the world as the world is, and logic, I think, does that best. Clear thinking is really important. Logical thinking is really important. If you're presenting a straw man argument. Um, then I think it's the case that you need to that you're not thinking clearly, that you're not you're not seeing the world clearly, right? We want to understand reality as reality actually is. Now, can we actually do that? I don't know. I really don't know. Can we get close to understanding what reality actually is? And I would say that I think we can. Uh, I think it takes a lot of work. I think that it it's the case. I think it is the case that we both. I go back to paradigms, right? Uh, wherever you're standing, uh, par think of a paradigm as the, uh, like I said it in, in the past, a paradigm is the, the foundation of what you, what your thoughts are, okay? Uh, another way to think about a paradigm is, is um, you're putting on a pair of glasses with specific colored lenses, and because of that paradigm, you are going to be seeing uh, different things in the world. Um, if you put on infrared goggles, you're going to see infrared, right? And uh, so so... so the goal is to put on a pair of glasses, uh, lenses that will actually allow to you, allow you to see the world correctly well, um, allows you to see reality as it actually is. And I think that maybe we can, I think we can, maybe not all of reality, certainly not all of reality. We only get a tiny little sliver with our lives, right? Our, our, there's seven, 
billion, probably close to 8 billion now people in the world. And uh, we only live about 100 years, 80 years, something like that. And we've lived less in the past. And we just get a tiny little sliver of reality to call our own. And um, I don't know, I guess it's a little arrogant to assume that we can know anything. Uh, but I think you kind of have to function in that way. And as we function in that way, we've got to try our best to actually see the world as it is. So um, in writing, you see, in, in creativity, let's go broader. In creativity, you see the straw man fallacy used quite often. And I'm going to explain how uh, this relates to creativity in a bit. But, for, um, but first, I want to show, before I show the bad, because I think the bad will represent it better and show you what's happening better, I want to actually represent a, a straw man, uh, the, the opposite of a straw man in literature uh, and so this is actually something good so the first thing that does not straw man the opponent uh, is paradise lost okay so if you are everybody has their specific ideas right everybody has their own specific ideas there's always people who disagree with you and if you're creative, you have your own specific ideas. I know that people who are creative assume they don't. Um, I think this is some. I think that people. This is this is a weakness. This is this is stupid thinking. I'm sorry. Like if you think like this, this is stupid. This is not correct. Uh, you I you run into people who are like, you're, I'm a free thinker. It's like, well, what do you mean by that? Uh, doesn't mean I'm a. I don't think consider myself a free thinker. I don't even consider myself a perfectly logical thinker because that isn't true, right? Uh, we're all using ideas that other people have passed on to us now is do you mean by a free thinker that you're creative because there you can be creative right you, you can be creative but i don't i don't know if that i think what people mean is that they don't just take on the ideas of somebody else right they don't make assumptions but that's not true you all everybody makes assumptions right your assumptions might not come from your parents. Your assumptions might might come from the culture around you. Your assumptions might come from your own experiences, right? And I think in most cases, your assumptions come from your own experiences. Um, but I, I don't, I don't know. Like, no, there's no. I don't think there's such thing as like what we understand a free thinker to be, who's just thinking their own thoughts without any input from anybody else. And maybe, maybe I'm misrepresenting. Maybe I'm strawmanning that, right? But uh, I, I don't think of myself as a free thinker. I don't think of myself as radically different than everybody else on earth. I don't think of myself as who's do, someone who's doing a major, a uh, lot of different thinking. I don't even think logically all the time. I try to be logical, but I certainly don't think logically all the time. And maybe it's the case that it'd be a little bit psychopathic uh, to think logically all the time. But even creative people, and I think this is a blind spot for creative people. So if you're a creative person and you think that um, if you think that, oh yeah, you know, I, I think out of the box, I don't do this. I think you do. Uh, and the reason why I think you do is because I think everybody does. I, I think this is just something we as humans do. And if you assume you don't, and you should just ask people, you know, um, instead of, uh, ask people who are, who will be brutally honest with you. I think that you do this because I think everybody does. Now, do I know everybody in the world? No, but I know uh, from, we work with what we see, right? And from what I know of how people work and from what I know of what I've seen in people. So people have specific ideas they hold on to and people base their, how they, how they function in reality off those ideas, okay? Um, like I said before, it's a paradigm. It's a lens you're looking through to see reality and work your work your way through reality. Okay, um, so when you're a creative person, you are in a group. When you're a creative person, you are in a group. Um, maybe there's someone who isn't right, but the majority of us are normal, and the majority of creative people are more like the are with. When you're a creative person, you're in a group and you have specific ideas of that group and there are people who disagree with you. And that's the important thing is you, you hold specific ideas highly in your mind and there's people who disagree with those ideas. Okay. And what we tend to do uh, as humans is, is when we present, when we 
put specific people who disagree with us in our in our writing in our creative work we we um, make them into a caricature and then we straw man what they are saying and that's where I'm going with this okay so we make them into a caricature if we don't agree with them and we straw man what they are saying and we might not be doing it on purpose we might not have any ill will toward that group right we might we might not have any ill will toward that group and we just might do it because we don't understand what they're actually saying and this is why talking to people who disagree with you is unbelievably important which everybody needs to do more of in my opinion I, I don't know anyone who probably does enough of it maybe there is maybe there's someone but we tend to like people who agree with us so that's why I think there's probably not enough of it so one uh, one writer who one writer who does not fall into this trap of caricaturing his enemy and straw manning the enemy's argument is Milton uh, Paradise Lost okay so you've got Milton with Paradise Lost, and Milton is a Christian, and he's in a very Christian setting. And Milton writes Satan as almost an anti-hero. And if anybody knows anything about anti-heroes in literature, they're usually pretty likable, okay? So Milton writes Satan as an anti-hero, and Milton makes you understand Satan, and Milton makes Satan attractive. And Milton thinks Satan is the evil one, right? Milton thinks Satan is Satan, right? <laughs> um and that's that's a situation where he isn't just making i mean it's okay to parody people it's okay to poke fun at people i tend to not like i tend to not like people um i tend to not like humor that's in bad faith right i think there's certain instances where someone is just a, uh, not a uh, some, uh, people who put down other people you know people who are bad and put down other people who go out of their way to um, belittle people I'm more inclined to make fun of that person in bad faith but people who are just regular people trying to do their best uh, I tend to not like bad faith humor uh, in general but there are there are some people that I'm like you know maybe we should make fun of them in a way that just is uh, ridiculing them but Milton didn't do that with Satan Milton presented satan uh in a way that was in a way that was likable right he didn't present him in a way that where you're like well that's a stupid argument oh this is dumb that's dumb and it might have been the case that milton was taking ideas from like the bible and saying oh well you know this presents him as attractive right because there are certain things in the bible that present satan as attractive and um it, uh, presenting his ideas and what he present like he he he's tempting people that's the idea and if you are tempting someone you have to use some something that's attractive to tempt a person but at the same time he doesn't present uh satan as this grotesque being which is often the case in uh modern in in a lot of literature and a lot of media and a lot of creative work satan is presented as this really ugly being and milton takes a different attack uh, Milton decides to do something else he decides to present Satan as a very attractive creature as a very attractive character and it makes the it makes the story a lot more interesting because he didn't caricature Satan and he didn't straw man what he was saying who his argument essentially um, and you might be saying well see um, in in literature in movies books uh, in whatever creative thing we're making people aren't making an argument but if, if your characters are speaking they're presenting specific ideas and uh, you it's not an argument like a logical argument but in, in a way it presents specific ideas and it has a structure similar to an argument uh, that might be a different podcast episode but if you're writing a book if you're writing if you're writing a story uh, you're it has similarities to an argument and uh, you have you have specific characters so if I have a character uh, let's give me an I'll, I'll give you an example so if I'm writing a book and I have my specific ideas right and I decide hey you know I'm gonna put a character who has opposite ideas of myself and I create a character who's the biggest idiot in the world and he just says these ideas that I disagree with so what I'm doing is I'm presenting an argument in a way it's not a real argument but I'm presenting a character who believes the complete opposite of me and I'm making him an idiot and I'm presenting him as an idiot so that the audience thinks oh you know people who think this way are idiots okay so I'm caricaturing that group 
And besides caricaturing that group, I'm pretty much saying their arguments are idiotic, right, um, through the character. So that's why I say we're caricaturing and then we're straw manning the argument they're presenting. We're saying, oh, we're not doing it directly. Uh, if you are, when you're creating something, when you're doing creative work, it's probably best to stay away from doing things directly and do it in a more nuanced way. I'm not gonna say that definitively that it is better, um, but it tends to be the case that if it's more nuanced and layered, it's better than if it's just right out in your face. I've seen some, I've seen some work, uh, some creative work that is um, right on the nose, which I'm going to be getting into, and it's not as good as the stuff that isn't right on the nose. Uh, I do like work with meaning, okay? I really like creative work that has a lot of meaning, but if I present something in my creative work that is, if, I, if I'm presenting my side as completely right and there's no legitimacy the, to the other side. And what I mean by legitimacy is there's no good questions asked, there's no good arguments made. Uh, there's no good arguments made, there's no smart people over there. Just, uh, some people might misunderstand this. So, so people who, uh, some people might say, well, you know what? Um, but they don't have good arguments because they're not true. The, the Whether an argument is good or not is not based on whether it is true, okay? Whether an argument is good or not is not based on whether it is true. Let me say it again. Now, a, a good argument is not necessarily true. A true argument, um, because you have different parts. It's the syllogism, and that's what I'm getting back to. So you have this, uh, which way would you understand it? This, therefore that, then that, right? Um, it's like, it's the basic argument, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. Now, if all men are not mortal, that argument breaks down, okay? Um, if So there's certain things that, that you'd run into that would make the argument bad, so, for example, a logical fallacy. If you have a logical fallacy in your argument, your, your conclusion might be true, right? Your conclusion might actually be true, but you have a logical argument in your fallacy. And that's what I mean by that. So, a good argument is not necessarily a true argument. A good argument is one that is logical and tries its best to fall into that logical structure and follow those logical rules. Um, a argument that has a true conclusion is not necessarily a good argument. What we want is we want an argument with a true conclusion that is a good argument too, because you're not going to convince anybody with an argument that's bad. But um, if you are if you are um, creating work like I said that is too on the nose and doesn't have any nuance and doesn't even take into consideration your opponent, right? If you're if you're creating a uh, if you're writing a book. If you're writing music, if you're uh, making a movie and you have it, it and it's presenting an idea that has an opposite, like, so it's, it has an idea, right? And then that idea is like, has an opposite. Um, well, how would I say that? How would I say that? You know, there's these arguments that there's two sides to these arguments and there's an actual debate going on on both of these sides. There's an actual debate and there's actually good arguments on either side of it. Um, if you're presenting something like that and you're putting it out into our world and our culture is debating this and you're presenting only one side, you're doing yourself a disservice. And that's what I mean, right? If our culture is actively debating something, then you're doing something a disservice. If you're not even aware that there's a debate, you just probably need more experiences, read more, uh, go around people who aren't like you. Like I said, everybody needs to do that. It's not just you, but, um, when you when you create something that doesn't take into consideration that other side of the debate because if you're if you're presenting something that is is being debated and you're not and you're not presenting the other side of the debate um you're essentially saying i'm right and there's no there's no argument to be had about this specific thing so um the biggest offenders that i've noticed in the creative world for this are politics and religion Politics and religion. Um, stories focusing on politics and religion seem to always, not always, but in almost all cases, seem to present their opponents as caricatures and their opponents' arguments as straw men. Okay? 
It doesn't happen all the time. It happens a lot. And the reason why, and now politics and religion are very, very similar because everybody has their specific ideology and everybody is trying to fight for their ideology. Um, the, some people try to fight harder for the, their ideology than others. Now, the reason why politics, okay, the reason why politics and religion are so tightly held beliefs. These are the, this is the reason why people hold them so tightly. When someone believes in a religion, they believe that as the, the, the highest level of truth there is possible in the world. And people who believe a religion believe that the greatest amount of change that is going to happen in the world is going to happen through that religion, right? If they are actually serious about that religion. Because um, a, if you believe in specific religious tenet, uh, tenets, right? If you believe in specific religious tenets, what happens is you believe you are believing in a a meta narrative, right? You're believing in an idea that undergirds reality itself. Um, you're believing, oh, you know, these are the things that are more true than anything else, right? Uh, that's the best way I can put it right now. These are the things that are going to change the world. And then the same thing happens with politics. When people are really into politics, it is often the case that people believe that their political stance is what is going to be most beneficial to the world, what is going to change or create the best world to live in, the best society to live in. So that is why people hold politics and religion so closely, because they believe it is the best way to, it is the it will bring about the best result in the world, right? The best result in the world is through politics or religion, according to those people. When people hold Group, when people hold beliefs really tightly, they don't want those beliefs to be questioned because they don't want those beliefs to be untrue. Uh, like I said before, it is very difficult to question your own beliefs. I think it is something you should do. I think you should search to see whether that's true. Um, one important thing to do is to present your beliefs in the strongest possible argument with the strongest po possible argument. Present your opponent's beliefs with the strongest possible argument with the intent on knowing the truth because the truth is very important. Um, now, when these two groups, when the political, when the religious create movies, when the political, when the religious create, uh, when the political, when the religious create books, when the political, when the religious create art, what they often do is they portray their religious or their political opponent, opponent as a caricature. They portray their arguments uh, as a straw man. When, when this happens. And like I said, the reason why this happens is because, because they are, they are, um, what am I trying to say here? They are, they hold these beliefs really closely and they don't want these beliefs to be wrong, but there's a little bit more to it as well. But that's like the basic gist of why people tend to do this because uh, it's hard to say that you're wrong and it's hard to even consider, am I right? It's hard to be like, well, am I right about this? Some people are absolutely certain about everything they believe. You know, um, just look into it. You know, if it's the truth, uh, a guy I met, I worked with him a little bit, and one of the it's one of the a really interesting thing I heard, and I don't know how true it is, but I think it I think it is true. What he said is that the truth does not have to worry about a lie. Right, the truth is more powerful than lies. And I, I think there's something to that, right? I think that the truth is more powerful than lies. So if something is true and you're seeking out the truth and you're, you're, um, I think that you're going to find that, that what the truth is, right? So when people who are hyper political or, okay, when people are creating religious, uh, art, I'm going to use art broadly. So it, it encompasses music and it encompasses literature. When people are religious who are, cre are creating art, when people who are political are creating art, when you're, we're creating, when we are creating specifically religious or political art, um, people, and, and I'm, there are instances where the art is specifically created for a political or religious reason. And I'm going to exclude those. Okay. So if I'm creating a political poster, that is going to, of course, present my argument in the best possible light, right? If I'm creating a campaign poster for my favorite politician, that is going to 
only take on my side. If I'm creating religious art that is meant to be used within a church, that's only going to take on my side. But I'm talking about religious art and I'm talking about political art that is meant to be consumed by people in general, right? This is this is not this is not art for religious or politics sake. This is art that is meant to be entertaining, right? This is art that is meant to be art. Does that make sense? Um, there's art that is meant to be used in a practical way. Uh, for example, if I design a logo for logo for a business, that art is not for the sake of art. If I design a political campaign poster, that is art not for the sake of art. If I design a uh, if I design a song for a religious service, that is I do not consider that art for the sake of art. Okay, if I um, if I create if I make a movie. You know, if I make a movie and I'm trying to tell the best story possible, or if I make a movie and I'm putting it out for other people to experience, then I consider that art for the sake of art. And I probably should explain what I mean by art for the sake of art. Art for the sake of art is art that is meant to show the human experience, right? Um, I Like I said, I, this, is my, this is my paradigm that I'm working off of, just to be honest. Uh, I believe that art is meant to allow us to understand the world better and by by um, and it's not just like absolute truths as I've talked about in the past it's the it's the it's not just understanding the world in a scientific way it is understanding the experiences of others and the human experience better specifically okay so art for art's sake that's what I mean when I say that so when people put out political and religious art into the world, and this doesn't happen all the time, what they want is they want people to agree with them. Uh, they want people to agree with them when they put that out. But I think that, and they want, they want the world in general to believe what they believe. Because if someone is creating art that is very political and very religious, and they're creating it for the sake of art, um, when they're putting it out into the world, they want the other people around them to believe that art. They want other people around them to believe those ideas that are present in that art. But what is happening is actually the opposite. So this is what happens. This is the process. And I'm going to be done after this. This is the process. And then I'm going to maybe rant a little bit. And then I'll be done. So we have a closely held belief, right? It doesn't have to be religious. It doesn't have to be political. But those are the easiest things to point to. Uh, we are insulated, right? What happens usually in these cases is the, the group is insulated from everybody else. There's no outside input saying, hey, maybe you're wrong, which they might not be wrong, right? The group might not be wrong, but it's still important, even if you're correct, to um, know that there are other people who disagree with you and have people disagreeing with you. So this group is insulated. This is typically what happens. Um, this group already views their enemies as caricatures. This group already views their enemies' arguments as straw men, right? The weakest possible argument. This group creates art. If their enemies, uh, the opposite side of the debate, right? If the, their enemies are, de are portrayed, they are portrayed as an inch deep, right? The enemies are caricatured in the art because the enemies are caricatured in the community. Uh, the beliefs the beliefs that is held by that group are the strongest and uh, the the beliefs that are held by that enemy in the story is weak and is a straw man. The enemy is presented as weak, uh, the enemy is presented as stupid, evil, etc. So we are, we are turning the enemy into an ad hominem. We are turning the enemy's arguments into a, into a straw man fallacy. I don't even know if you can use that that way. So what happens in this art is, is it never takes on real people who disagree with our group, that group, right? Our art, that art never or barely ever questions the beliefs or it questions it in a way that isn't actually questioning the belief, okay? Um, what happens is the group, our group, loves what's created, People are saying, oh, yeah, you know, this is good. Yeah, we agree. That was excellent. That was so good. And the reason why they love that it, what has been created is because it agrees with them. They don't love it because it's good art. They do not let, love it because it's good art. They don't love it because it's beautiful. They love it because it's telling them what they already think. Okay? And I, uh, I think this is true. 
This happens a lot. I don't like it. I don't like, I do not like art that is hijacked by ideologies to just spread the ideology. Okay. And I'll explain a little bit more after this, what I think you should do if you have an ideology. Uh, if you believe something deeply, because I believe things deeply, and I try to not do this, you know, there might be some stuff that, that creeps in, but I try to not do this in my art. Um, so that group loves what uh, is created, and then everyone else doesn't even care about it because they're like, well, this is trash because it's not good art. Because if you make good art, people are going to be drawn toward that art. It's going to, um, it's going to make them think think your thoughts after you right it's going to hijack their brains essentially and it's going to be like hey you know like this is beautiful this is wonderful i love it and it turns people away from your ideas so people put these things out into the world because they want people to agree with them and in the end it turns people away from your the ideas that that they have because they're not creating real art they're just having they're taking art they're gutting art they're sticking their ideas in art and then they are um and then they're they're putting the, their idea their ideas out in in a in like a Trojan horse of art, right? There, there's nothing inside of it. Uh, the only thing that's inside of it is your, is your ideas. The art actually doesn't exist. Okay, so somebody might be like, well, if I if I put my ideas in art, it's good, you know. Somebody might be like, well, I my ideas are the truth. Someone might say that, right? They might be like, well, my ideas are the truth. So if I put my ideas in art, it's good because art's supposed to tell the truth, right? Yes, but no. Okay. Yes, but no. You are taking your own little subjective experience when you're an artist. You're taking your own little subjective experience. You're looking at the world. You're trying to portray the world as clearly as possible. And by the world, you might, I might mean, I, I might mean the physical world, right? When I'm writing about a stream, I want people to be able to experience that stream. But in the end, I'm not writing about just that physical world. The more important part of art is that human experience, okay? And you might say, well, my ideology is true. First of all, you are an itty bitty person. Uh, there are um, billions of other people besides you and you might very well be it might very well be the case that you are correct but have a little humility first of all uh, second just because your ideology is true doesn't mean that you should be putting it in art the way that I have already presented it if your ideology is true it will show through the art if you just try to make good art and be truthful about reality and the human experience. Uh, I definitely believe this is the case. If you hijack art, because uh, people who hijack art and stick their ideology in it and they use art as a vehicle just for their ideology, they're not, they're, it's, they're not using art correctly, first of all. And they're not, and it, and it comes across as they are so afraid that their ideology won't show through the art, okay? They are sh so afraid their ideology won't show through the art that they have to be so ham-fisted about it. Does that make sense? That's what bugs me because, first of all, it's like I said before, it's only only enjoyable to your in-group. It's only enjoyable to your in-group. It's not valuable as art. It's not valuable as art. It's um, Maybe it's valuable as preaching. And I'm not just talking about religion here. I'm talking about any very highly valued... Um, I'm, I'm talking about any very, very highly valued ideology, and it might be even like scientific thinking, right? If you're putting it into art, it doesn't happen as often, but it could happen, right? But it's not valuable as art. It's not, it, it, it's just, it, it's a, so C.S. Lewis, um, he, he, he has his Narnia series, and in his Narnia series, the last book, there's a donkey, and the donkey dresses up like a, um, the donkey dresses up like a, a a lion because he's presenting himself as Aslan, right? Aslan is the within the um, parable of the Narnia series. Aslan is God, right? Aslan is the Christ figure in that. So the donkey is dressing up to present himself as the Christ figure, and and C.S. Lewis is like, oh, this is the Antichrist presenting himself as the Christ figure in the Narnia series. But what hap What you're doing? 
with art, if you're hijacking it for this extreme ideological purpose, is you are, you're taking a donkey and you're dressing it up like a lion. You're taking something, you're taking, uh, you're taking something that does have a specific function. You know, donkeys are good for certain things and you're dressing them up as a lion and saying that, oh, this is good art when it's not actually good art because it's not, it's not truthfully, it's not taking on, it's not taking on um, reality. It's not taking on the human experience in a true way. It's taking on the human experience in a facetious, lying way, even if what you're saying is the truth, right? Like I said before, if what you're saying is the truth, and you might disagree with me on this, but I do have faith in this, that this is the case. If you, if, if you are trying to make good art and you're trying to understand the world and you're trying to understand human experience, you're trying to understand the underlying absolute truths of the world, you're trying to understand the underlying uh, truths of human experience, I think you're going to be creating art that reflects the underlying bigger truths in reality. Okay, and if you if what you believe is actually the truth and you make good art, you're going to be you're going to be reflecting that truth in reality. And you're going to be reflecting you're going to be reflecting that truth in reality in a way that is relevant to the people around you, uh, relevant to your culture, relevant to your time period. Um, two big two big offenders and we'll just get done with this two big offenders uh, and how they present their enemies, uh, and I'm going to take um, the political, I'm going to take the religious, and I'm going to do the political first. One big offender was the um, shoot, the Cheney movie with Christian Bale, where it presented um, it presented Cheney as this evil man who controlled everything. It's a caricature of him. It's a caricature of him. It's a caricature of the Bush presidency. Uh, it's not presenting, it's not giving the best hearing to the opponents um, of the Bush president, uh, the proponents of the Bush presidency, is essentially saying they have nothing to bring to the table whatsoever, right? And um, I believe that Bush was elected with a majority. Uh, no, wait. Oh, maybe one of the one of those was a majority for his election. Um, so yeah, because people freak out over that. But half the country elected Bush, so you're presenting half the country as illegitimate, right? Um, you're presenting them as as out of the millions, well, out of the millions, I think there's more millions, out of the millions of people that, well, it wasn't half the country, okay, so, like, you have millions of people liking Bush, right, and uh, you're presenting those millions of people, there's not one intelligent person with one good argument or one good reason for electing him, and there's not, there's no intelligent in the presidency, right, I don't like this, I don't like this at all, and I don't care where it comes from, I do not like this um, presentation of people at all, I think that you should give people a fair hearing. You should see people in a nuanced way. Even if that person's evil, try to see them in a nuanced way. They might be evil. They might be doing evil things. But it just assumes that you are incapable of doing anything bad. There were there were millions of people. There, were, there have been millions of people throughout the history of the world who've done bad things who are just normal people. Okay? Um, Besides that, okay, so so there's the Cheney movie, and then there's like the God's Not Dead movie, and the God's Not Dead movie presents the atheist as this mean person who puts people down, and there are certainly mean atheists, right? There's mean atheists, there's mean Christians, there's mean any ideological group, there's mean people. That's just how it is. Um, but at the end of the movie, and I just think this is so laughable, he becomes a Christian because you know you have to have everything turn out good because um, because if it is Nobody, nobody can disagree with Christianity right before they die. I think it's laughable because it essentially says that he did not actually believe what he thought. I think there are definitely people who are atheists who believe what they think. And things might, sorry for my uh, cam moving back and forth. And there are things that they're like, yeah, you know, this is what I believe and this is why I believe it. And it might be very a very good argument. And I think it's just stupid to say, well, you know, he didn't believe it enough that he would die. He would go and he would die. First of all, that's not how reality works. Because we've got to, what happened in that movie is we had to fit, um, Christians had to fit their own, they had to fit a story into their ideology. And uh, in my opinion, they don't need to do that because their ideology is, if, you're, if your ideology requires that the bad guy in your movie who's an atheist becomes a Christian, 
Uh, I think that you have a very narrow view of Christianity, and I actually think you have a warped view of Christianity. Uh, boy, I'm there's no there's no. I'm a Christian, okay, and there's no I'm not worried about saying it. I will say it. I don't care. That's fine with me. Um, but I think that if you're someone who needs to present Christianity as like that, and you pr need to present the arguments of Christianity like that, and you need to say, oh, this person will become a Christian. I think you've got it wrong. You know, I think you've got it wrong. Um, I think it's important because I'm a Christian. I believe that that is the truth, right? If I think it's the truth, I think it's important. Otherwise I wouldn't be a Christian. I think it's eminently important. It's like, as a Christian, I think it's the most important thing ever. Uh, but but Christianity and the Bible, because I'm assuming you're getting your information from there, they do not present the world as a simple um, idea, right? Uh, somebody might say they do, but I, I don't think they do. I think there's a lot of nuance, and I think there's a lot of suffering and pain. I think there's a lot of um, difficulty. There's a lot of things that are not answered that is like, hey, you know, this is part of reality and you just have to deal with it. Um, and the answer that's given is not a answer you can just say, oh, this is the reason this happens. Uh, people tr people always try to put reasons on something. Um, but I think that if you're actually, if you actually have a clear idea of what Christianity is and what it believes and what it says, like actually the Christian ideas, it's a very, it's more in line with what the Jews think than um, what a lot of Christians in the world think today, a, a large contingency, contingency of Christians. Because Jews have this idea that the world is not all happiness. And there's this there's this belief in modern Christianity that, that Christianity is meant to make you happy. And I've never, I've never seen that, okay? Um, I don't think it's true, and I don't think it has answers for people who are suffering, right? If you say, oh, you know, Christianity, like it, 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 the, the greatest extent this happens is like the Joel Osteen thing where he's like, you know, like if you are a Christian, you're going to be rich and yada, yada, yada. God wants you to be, uh, God wants you to be, what do you call it? Um, wealthy, right? Essentially, he wants you to be prosperous. And there's ideas of, hey, God wanting the, the Jews to prosper in the Bible, but Christ himself says, he's like, hey, you know, you're going to suffer because of me. So that is, there is uh, opposition, right? He tells his disciples and uh, his direct disciples. And should any other Christian expect that if his disciples who knew him the best suffered, should we expect anything different? And I think there's other other passages that do support this idea of suffering rather than than. Um, everything going well and there's this idea that that if you are a christian everything goes well and everything's perfect and there's different different layers of everything being perfect but one of these one of the ways that this is presented is these christian movies that is just they're just a sanitized reality presented to people reality is very gritty reality is very dark uh if and i do believe it, it is true if christianity is true it is functioning within a very dark world within with a lot of screwed up things, right? If Christianity is true, um, it is functioning in a world that is really, really messed up in a lot of different ways. It's really easy to see that. So I, I just don't think that these, these movies have, um, I don't think they're presenting, I don't think they're creating good art because first of all, they're not even presenting the world as it is. And they're not presenting the experiences of people as they actually go through them. The experiences of people are, I think, in general, much more difficult than what is presented. Uh, and I, uh, you can totally disagree with me if you're not a Christian, but I think that if, if Christians actually took on Christianity in the way that it presents itself, that they would be making, making artwork that is much, not grittier, but just so much more depth to it. You can totally disagree with me about that, though. So I just had to have my two uh, put my two cents in for that because that's that's something I want to change. I want I want this stupid sanitized Christian art to go away. I'm sick of it, and I want I want political art. Uh, I want art that is unbelievably politicized to go away too. But um, since I'm in the Christian sphere, I definitely want that Christian art to go away because I just I'm just sick of it.
congratulations, you got to the end of my podcast. So you either had to listen to my voice or you had to listen to my voice and watch my face, which I don't envy you. Let's just say that. But if, you, uh, if you're someone who likes this podcast and you're thinking, you know, I'd like to support him in this podcast or the other creative things he's doing, creative things I'm doing, uh, you know, there's a few things you can do because some people, some people don't know what they can do to support people who create stuff. So these are the few things you can do that will really, really help me. First of all, check out my website, check out the other things I'm doing. Uh, second, comment on things, share them, like them, subscribe, subscribe if you haven't already. And the third thing you can do is give reviews on different places. All right. So uh, the biggest thing for this podcast is going on to iTunes, giving it an honest review, telling people why you like it, telling people why you hate my voice, why you hate my face, but telling people why they should really check it out, despite the fact that I have so many failings in terms of looks and voice. Um, other than that, if you if you want to check out my books, grab a, grab a copy of the book and uh, listen to the serialized novel. Give, give digital copies away. That's a really big thing too. I always want to give you something that is valuable to you. I always want to give someone listening to this podcast something that's going to, going to stick with them or a book that they can actually own. Uh, and, and you can own that book for very, very cheap. So go check that out on Amazon. Uh, d the different things I said, subscribe, upvote, comment, share, and definitely, definitely give it a review on, on iTunes. All right, as always, my name is Daniel Poppy, and this is How to Write Good. Three, four.